Psalm 103 and picking it up in verse number 1. Psalm 103, verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. And let's pray. Lord, thank you. It is good to be here tonight, and I am glad that I am here. There's no place else I'd rather be and I, here on a Sunday night. And I thank you, Lord, uh, for uh, church and Sunday night church and for, for our service tonight and for each person that's come. And, uh, Lord, that's uh, tuned in to listen to uh, the message. Uh, would you speak to our hearts? Would you help us, Lord, in our lives uh, to bring more glory for you? Uh, to you and to be more uh, profitable and, and prosperous, Lord, and fruitful in our Christian lives uh, for you. Help it to be so, Lord. Uh, we can't do it without you, but uh, with you we can do all things. So give us light from the scriptures tonight and uh, and give somebody, Lord, maybe a, a good piece of the puzzle that will help them in their life. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, last couple of Sunday nights we've been looking at the subject of renewing, and we're going to continue to explore that subject uh, tonight. In the first message, uh, we talked about the renewing of salvation. Uh, the renewing of your mind, about being renewed day by day, um, a renewal revival. And then uh, we talked about renew the altar and went through a number of things about that. Last week, the second message, I talked to you about renewing your spirit, uh, renewing your bow. Well, it's not the one you put in your hair, but uh, your fight, as it were. Renewing your strength and then the renewing of the earth. And so uh, when we talk about the idea of renewing, to renew by definition uh, has to do with such concepts as uh, follows. Uh, to restore to a former state or to a good state, if it wasn't formerly in good, uh, to restore to a former state uh, or to a good state after decay or deprivation, uh, to rebuild, to repair. So something that was good and then degenerated to restore that to a good state or to repair it to a good state. Or if something uh, never was in a good state, like just say uh, you're a lost sinner, uh, that renewal of salvation brings you to a good state uh, after your depraved state. Uh, furthermore, it's to, to reestablish, uh, to confirm, uh, as also can be a re renewing, an idea of renewing, uh, to, re um, to, to repeat as to renew expressions of friendship. So in other words, you're, you're going back over it again. You're going to renew that thing. You're going to renew a promise, renew an attempt, um, renew a library book. You know, you, you had it out. Time is up. You want to keep it out. You're going to renew it. So you're going to repeat that thing. You're going to get it to where you can con continue on uh, with that uh, with that book or that thing. Um, further to to revive, and we talked about renewal revival, uh, as to renew the glories of an ancestor or of a former age to bring that glory back uh, to renew to begin again. It's like a new start, a fresh start. Uh, a number of those things can especially apply what we're going to talk about and consider tonight. I'm going to find that consideration uh, as we read it in uh, Psalm 103, verse 5, which says, Of the Lord, first, he's the who there, who satisfieth thy mouth, that's our mouths, uh, your mouth as you read it, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. Uh, so now I'm going to talk to you about uh, renewing your youth. That'd be a wonderful thing, wouldn't it? <laughs> renewing your youth. Uh, the cry of those that are aging is, uh, oh, to be young again. But we're going to try to help you with that uh, idea tonight from the scriptures. Uh, Psalm 103, verse 5, gives us hope that uh, this is a goal that just might be attainable. Um, another of Webster's 1828 de dictionary definitions of renew is this, to make new. Renew, it's new again. To make new, to make fresh or vigorous as to renew youth. And so that's what we're going to talk about tonight is um, some hope for uh, aging bodies uh, or some hope for bodies, you know, before they become aging and, and you know, feeling the, the pains of, uh, of age. Or if you are feeling the pains of age, some hope even in that, that state, according to the scriptures. And we look at these things and, and, you know, there comes a time in life, I'm sure, where all of this just seems impossible. You know, you reach that point, you get there and uh, I've reached the point of no return. Uh, but I believe that I believe while you're still alive and breathing, there's hope. <laughs> there's hope for the Lord to do something in your life. First, if you're alive and breathing and lost, no matter how old you are and how sick you are, there's hope you can get saved. That's the first thing. But if you're still alive and still breathing, you are saved. And uh, there's hope for things to get even better. 
And I realize it doesn't look like that sometimes. I realize it looks like sometimes this is impossible. But let's remember the words of the Lord Jesus. With men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Let's also remember his declaration, the Lord's declaration in Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 20, Paul de declaring of the Lord how that God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. God can. I know he doesn't always do what we want him to do or what, what he can do, but um, he's got the ability. And when this, this thing about renewing your youth here is brought out in the scriptures, there must be a possibility uh, of it, at least in uh, certain circumstances. So uh, we're going to consider that tonight, uh, renewing your youth. Now, hold Psalm 103. We are going to be back there. But I, I want to show you a, pos a situation where this happened uh, to somebody in the scriptures. Go to 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter number 5. And we'll look at a man for just a little bit uh, named uh, Naaman and uh, his story. Naaman was a, a captain of the host of the king of Syria. So he's a military man, and he was a mighty man of, uh, of valor, a great man with his master. And, and we read about him beginning in 2, Corinthians, or 2 Kings, rather, chapter 5, verse number 1. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but... He was a leper. He was a strong man, a mighty man, a good military man, uh, got the job done, but he had leprosy. Well, it's kind of rough if you have leprosy. I mean, it's a degenerating disease, and it just keeps going. It desensitizes you to the place where um, you can get injuries and sores where your limbs, uh, limbs, limbs, different parts of your body fall off, uh, fingers, toes, hand. It's just a, it's a, it's a dreadly disease, and he had it. And in verse number two, it says, And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. So this little Israelite girl uh, was waiting on the wife of Naaman, the captain uh, for the army of the host of the king of Syria. <clears throat> and she said under her mistress, uh, Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria. So he's, she's telling them, you know, too bad. Too bad your husband can't meet up with this guy, this prophet that I know of in Samaria. Uh, he said, she, she said, for he would recover him of his leprosy. Now, she certainly knew uh, the power of the prophet in Samaria. And the, the one she's referring to is Elisha. And he'd already, you know, he'd been around as the prophet in chief since uh, chapter number two, but he'd already done enough miracles where the fame of his power with the Lord has, has gone out, and she just figures if Naaman could get to him, he could heal him of his leprosy. And so she says that in verse number four, and one went in and told his Lord. So word of this gets out, somebody hears it, goes in and tells Naaman. Uh, and one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus saith the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the, the king of Syria said, Go to, uh, go, uh, the the king, maybe that was the Lord that they, they went and spoke to, but uh, both of them got the word. The king and Naaman would get the word. And the king of Syria said, go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him 10 talents of silver and 6,000 pieces of gold and 10 changes of raiment. To get into his good graces, that's the understanding of that. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, now, when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent... My, set Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. <laughs> so you just imagine the king getting a letter like this. Well, you don't have to imagine it. You can read about it. Verse number seven. It came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter that he rent his clothes and said, Am I a god to kill and to make alive, that this man does send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. He thought, this guy's looking for trouble. He sends this leper and, and, and uh, all these gifts wants me to heal him up. Uh, he just wants trouble. He wants a reason to go to war with me. But, verse 8, at the paragraph mark, And it was so when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot. 
and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. <laughs> Elisha's a character. I get this, I get this picture as I read about Elisha. I get this picture of a, a guy who's, uh, he just living the good life as a prophet. He got the power of God. Um, he's not, not exerting himself too much. He's going to do what he has to do. But, um, you know, he's just going to kind of sit back and kick back and relax. And and here comes this, um, I mean, Elisha once said, send him to me and, and, and we'll show you there's a prophet in Israel. But when he comes, look what he does. Verse uh, 9, so Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him. He doesn't even come to the door himself. Elijah's like, I don't know, he's sitting down eating supper, maybe kicking kick him back, you know, having something to eat, reading a book or whatever. <laughs> he says, you go tell him this. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him saying, go and wash in Jordan seven times and thy flesh shall come again to thee and thou shalt be clean. And Naaman, he's furious. Next, next verse says, but Naaman was wroth. He was just upset. He's upset. He did. He expected at least to see the prophet. Moreover, he had an idea of how this was going to go. Look at 11. But Naaman was wroth and went, and went away and said, Behold, I thought. You know, that's a lot of times where we get in trouble. You can get in trouble because of, of, of thinking your way into trouble. And sometimes you can get in trouble by not thinking enough. But they can go both ways. But here he thought it was going to be one way. And it didn't happen that way. He said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover uh, the leper. I mean, that's what he thought it was going to happen. And, of course, it didn't happen that way. And um, uh, verse number 12 says, uh, he, he continues saying, Are not Abana and Farpar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned, to, turned and went away in a rage. <laughs> And I suppose he would have sort of given up on it, except for, um, you know, his servants got talking to him. Verse 13, and his servants came near and spake unto him and said, uh, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather than when he saith to thee, wash and be clean? They say, they're saying, look, you've got a good opportunity here. He said you're going to get healed. Isn't that what you want in the first place? And if he would have put on his big show and, and done it, you know, well, you would have you would have been happy with that. Or if he'd tell you to do some great thing, you would have been happy with that. But he just says, go wash me clean. Why don't you just go do it? And uh, Naaman says, uh, you know, he got a point. And verse 14, then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. Now, notice what it says. And his flesh came again, like unto the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. Now, that's what the promise was. The promise was in verse number 10, thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. And it said it came again and added that little clause, like unto the flesh of a little child. This was an adult man, a hardened military man who'd won victories, and he had leprosy, and he got his youth renewed to where his flesh was like that of a little child. Now, uh, though this was a supernatural intervention of God, and I understand that, you know, I understand this isn't the normal order of things, but though it was a supernatural intervention of God, um, you should note this. You should note that in order for Naaman to receive this benefit of his youth being renewed and his flesh coming again as a little child, there was something that he himself had to do. And so uh, I want to say this. If you want your youth renewed, uh, you're going to have to do something. You're going to have to do something. Uh, I, I suppose we want it to be more like Naaman had it. Certainly, there's a lot of factions of Christianity that want it like this, like this. And I don't think, maybe we don't go to the extreme that they do, but I don't think sometimes we're very far off. Uh, we want somebody to pray over us, strike his hand over the place, and say, pow, pow, be healed. And, um, and then just, you know, everything's good. And maybe you don't expect it to be in that charismatic fashion, but, but you want somebody to pray over you, you want to pray over yourself, and you want it to be healed. And God can do that sometimes. And he does tell us to pray for us, one another when we're sick. But there are some times when, when we have to do something. And if you want the, to, to realize the promise which he's given you in Psalm 103, there's something that you are going to have to do. Um, Naaman, Naaman wanted it different. Uh, Naaman, was, Naaman did not get that prescription that he wanted from the prophet. Uh, the prescription he got was, you're going to have to go uh, dip yourself seven times and wash in the Jordan River. And... You're going to have to humble yourself to do that. Uh, you're going to have to get up, humble yourself, go forth, and put forth some effort to get this done. And as we said, Naaman initially rebelled against this, but then he relents after the good talking to his servants gave him in verse 13. And it was a good thing for him that he did. 
Because if he had not, uh, he would have retained his leprosy. If he had not, he would have not seen what God can do. And if he had not, he would have not had his youth renewed. <clears throat> so again, very, very simple. I'm not trying to say that you're going to have to go <clears throat> to Israel and dip yourself seven times in the Jordan River. And everybody that does that is going to be healed of whatever sickness they've got. Uh, you think they have tourism over there now. <laughs> if that were true, uh, there'd, be, there'd be lines and no doubt somebody charging to get in. But I'm not saying that's what you have to do. But look in Psalm 103 again and notice that there is something that needs to be done in order for this promise to be realized in Psalm 103 in verse number 5. Now, God is involved, and it has to do with um, uh, what you put in your mouth. Psalm 103, verse 5. It says, Who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. So God provides us our food, and God provides us our, our drink, our sustenance. But here it's talking about the Lord providing you with, with good things, satisfying your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed uh, like uh, the eagles. So the thing that is highlighted here that needs to be done, that you have to do in order to have your new youth renewed, is um, you're going to have to put some good things in your mouth. Uh, that is to say this, uh, good food will help you to have good health. You know, uh, there's a lot of truth in the saying that you are what you eat. And this includes what you drink as well. But uh, they, they say you are what you eat. You put, you know you know this to be true. Uh, spiritually, let's talk spiritually for a moment. Well, old, old spiritual saying goes like this. Um, garbage in, garbage out. Talk about your brain, your mind, your heart. You put garbage in here spiritually, garbage is going to come out in your life. Well, there's a lot of truth with that in food as well. You put garbage in and, and it's going to manifest itself. The garbage is going to manifest itself in you. You say, well, I don't eat garbage. The problem is that they package garbage in pretty packages with nice colors and, and fragrant smells and good taste. And it just, we don't, we don't often uh, recognize it. A lot of times we don't recognize it. Oh, well, we do recognize it, but we don't care. But the food that you eat, it can help you or it can harm you. Uh, again, note the verse, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles with good things. Don't miss that. Because when it comes to food, a lot of times what we call good isn't good at all. We call it good, but it's not good for you. And virtually, when we say something is good, um, uh, virtually every time we say that, we're referring to its taste. But not everything that tastes good is good. Uh, let me ask you this. Think about it. <clears throat> Do you think that the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil tastes good? I'm inclined to think so. Eve <coughs> saw that, that it was good for uh, food. <laughs> you know, um, she ate it. Uh, Adam ate it after she had eaten it. it. It was something that was appealing. It was pleasant to the eyes. Uh, tree desired to make one wise. And it was good for food. Uh, she saw it. <laughs> she saw it. And she ate it. And, uh, and again, I think I'm on solid ground here when I say that it tasted good. But um, was it good? Well, it would ultimately kill her. It killed her spiritually as soon as she ate it. Physically, uh, she would die on the earth when she when she didn't have to. <clears throat> but um, but she partook of that thing, and it, it was not good for her. You know, sin sin has appeal, or else people wouldn't want to do it. And it may have pleasures like good taste, but the pleasures of sin are but for a season. <clears throat> it is worth noting, I think, that the first sin that um, the human race committed had to do with food. They put something in their mouth that they weren't supposed to have. And um, it, it just brought about this process of death uh, in their lives. You know, today, uh, people, they, they use even sinful terms when it comes to uh, food. They talk about taste-tempting food. Um, they talk about something being sinfully delicious. They're talking about food. <laughs> they talk about um, decadent food. Or decadent food is, you know, rich food. <laughs> decadent's an interesting word. Um, when you try some decadent food with taste tempting goodness that's um, sinfully delicious, uh, decadent by, by modern definition, current Merriam Webster definition, means this characterized by or appealing to self indulgence. Uh, the second one is marked by decay or decline. <clears throat> now, it's an interesting word, decadent. Uh, the, the little uh, prefix deca, D E C A, that's a reference to 10. And uh, what, what does 10, you know, have to do with, with decadence? 
with, with e indulging yourself or something marked by decay uh, or by uh, decline. Um, I think the way it works, I think the word decadent is related to another word that you don't hear a lot anymore, but it, but it's, um, it refers to something in the scripture, and that word is decalogue. And decalogue is another name for the Ten Commandments. And I think what, uh, what decadent is, is somebody that is violating those commandments in order to indulge themselves in the pleasures uh, of sin. And I think you could look about it, look at it like this, you know, a decadent and somebody putting a, putting a dent in the Decalogue, putting a dent in the Ten Commandments. They're, they're, they're breaking those commandments. And this, um, this is how they describe rich, good, pleasant tasting desserts. Uh, as as decadent. I'm not saying that everything that tastes good is bad for you, but I'm also not saying, because there's this misconception, that everything that's good for you, I'm not saying that everything that's good for you tastes bad. Uh, people tend to think that. But the reason why some people don't find uh, good food good tasting is the same reason why some uh, lost people don't find good living uh, appealing. You know, some people aren't uh, don't find good good food appealing to their taste, and lost people don't find good uh, living and right living and godliness, they don't find that uh, appealing to their life. You know, the lost man, he's so used to indulging himself with uh, sin that he finds good living bland, distasteful, unappealing. And the person that feeds constantly on junk food finds good food bland, distasteful, and unappealing. Now, uh, the, the problem is uh, there's a, in, in the United States of America, look, around the world, but uh, certainly in our country, there's an overindulgence in food that's really not good for you. And if you're going to have food that's really not the best for you, uh, you need to learn to do it moderately and, and sprinkling it, it a little bit here and there, not uh, by making that the, what you live on. They call it junk food for a reason. <laughs> that isn't something a preacher made up. That's the world calls it that. And so what you want is you want to take in food that's going to build your body. Your body needs stuff to, to strengthen it, to, to build it, to, to function properly. And you need some good, healthy food. And God's made uh, good, healthy uh, food uh, for us. And he'll provide you that. It's him in Psalm 103, verse 5, that will satisfy thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed, uh, like, like the eagles. The good things in your mouth help your youth to be renewed. So the first thing to do to renew your health is learn to satisfy your mouth with good things uh, more than bad things, a lot more than bad things. Cut out as many of the bad things as you possibly can um, and, uh, and satisfy your mouth with good things. Uh, ben Franklin had an interesting quote uh, about um, uh, really about this whole subject. He said this, I saw a few die of hunger, of eating 100,000. And Ben Franklin recognized that, uh, yes, yeah, some people do die of hunger, but more people die of eating, eating the wrong things and, and overeating, uh, which also reminds me to say about uh, that is beware of overeating. Um, like the Bible says, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Uh, be moderate. Don't overindulge. It takes discipline, especially when food is so readily available and bad food is so readily available. And you know, you know how it goes. You just you come home tired, and you don't feel like, you know, preparing something good. And you grab whatever you got uh, quickly. And a lot of times, whatever you got to get quickly <clears throat> isn't the best thing for you. Or if you don't have anything at home, you stop by and grab something, you know, easy, some some fast food. Not all fast food is bad food, but a lot of it is. Um, there's more healthy options at fast food restaurants today than there ever has been. But um, I don't know. Do you ever try those options? <laughs> just a thought. But, but it's just so easy to fall into the trap of something that's convenient. What's convenient is not always conducive to your health. And so you're going to have to, you're going to, have to discipline yourself. And uh, let's go over on that note uh, to a passage in 1 Corinthians that talks about that. Chapter number 9, 1 Corinthians 9. Every once in a while, we need a good exhortation along these lines about your health and about, um, about discipline. And Paul's talking about discipline here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, self-discipline. And he has, he's talking about it in relationship to physical condition and using that to bring this lesson home. And he says in verse 24, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. He says, so run that ye may obtain. Of course, we apply that to our spiritual race, so we're running. 
But notice what he says in verse 25, using this, following through with this and using it as an illustration. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. So whether it's a, a runner in training or somebody training for an, a, a, an Olympic discipline um, or, or something else competitively, when they are in training, they're temperate in all things. That is uh, moderate. They're, they're, they use moderation. They don't overindulge. They don't self-indulge. They, they, they do things to discipline themselves, not to partake of certain things. I, I've heard of, uh, of kids, you know, I mean, uh, some of them may have been saved and some of them some not, but when they're uh, in sports, you know, there's certain restrictions that their uh, coach will put upon them as far as what they can, can partake of because he wants him in the best shape, especially if you're in a sport that you know, involves running up and down the court like basketball, uh, just to stay, stay in good shape to be able to, to compete. And a lot of them during the season, they won't indulge in certain things just so that they can be in better shape to try to what? Win the prize. That's what Paul's talking about. <laughs> Certainly people in training for Olympic um, medals uh, in competition like that are, are doing that. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things, now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, that gold medal, that silver medal, that bronze medal. But we, an incorruptible, um, you know, gold, silver, precious stones, or the, the different crowns that the Lord may um, uh, reward us with. So Paul says, with that as a backdrop, I therefore so run. I'm going to run like that. I'm going to be temperate. I, I so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Paul said um, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. And look right here in the passage, one of the crowns that you can obtain um, in the, at the judgment seat of Christ. And this is for, for areas of self-discipline in your Christian life. And, you know, if you can learn to discipline yourself in one area, it will bleed over into another area. If you can learn to discipline yourself to, um, say, read your Bible, and you can handle that, that can help you to discipline yourself in saying no to certain things that you, you shouldn't eat or drink. Or reverse it. If you can discipline yourself, because some people get, get the one before the other, you can discipline yourself in areas of physical things to say no to certain things you shouldn't eat or drink, or to, to just uh, keep yourself in good physical shape, then you can certainly discipline yourself to read the Bible and to come to church, and to do those things that God would have you to do uh, as a Christian. But it takes discipline. You've heard me, many of you heard me say this many times, but um, uh, as God's people, followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are to be His disciples, and a disciple, the word disciple is connected with the word discipline. <clears throat> and a disciple must discipline himself to follow the Lord. He said, take up your cross uh, daily. And we're to die daily, and it's a matter of, of just dying to self. It's, it's, it, we have to remember this thing about the body. It is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And if any man defile the temple of God, the Bible says, him shall God destroy. You can defile it with sin, or you can defile it with bad health practices. And God's trying to help you to see there's some things that you can do to discipline yourself to make sure that you give your body the best chance uh, um, from a physical standpoint of, of being in good health. And he talks about satisfying your mouth with good things, again, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. That will take some self-discipline because just like sin, um, you know, it it's, seems sometimes easier to just partake of sin and more pleasurable and, uh, and harder to say no. And so it is sometimes easier to partake of, of foods that are convenient, easy, taste good, you know, they'll satisfy us for, for a little bit. And then, um, but what happens afterwards? What happens after the sin? You reap. What happens after you put the wrong things in your body? You reap. He that sow it to the flesh, love the flesh, reap corruption. Put in good things, let it rebuild and repair uh, that body and strengthen it and help to renew your youth. So there's a, a, a really a lot to do with what you have, uh, what you take in, what you partake of um, as far as the good things. You know, God's made good foods. Eat some of those good foods. I know, I know some of them don't taste good, but um, the reason, again, it's like Jesus said. I think it's Luke, um, Luke 5, uh, 39. I think I had it written here. Yeah, Luke 5, 39. He said, No man also having drunk old wine straightway desireth new, for he saith the old is better. You used to eating the junk or drinking the junk. You don't want to eat the good stuff. But you clean yourself out. You clean yourself out, and that stuff will um, taste good. 
you know, don't eat anything all day and, and, and then pick up, you know, an apple, say, you might not want to at first. You may be, you know, drawn to something else, but pick it up and eat it. All of a sudden you can taste it, you know, your, your taste buds have been renewed. <laughs> Um, after a few days of eating, you know, there's, there's good, healthy stuff. All of a sudden you begin to understand the taste uh, of it. Um, you know, I, I, I like to eat, I put together raw almonds and, and raisins. We buy raw almonds, you know, by the pound and these one pound bags at uh, Trader Joe's and they have the uh, good quality raw almonds and good price. And I get them. And then I get, um, a big box of what contains two, like two pound bags, of um, uh, uh, sun-made uh, raisins, and I'll mix them together. And I'll tell you what, after you know, after not eating all day, uh, if I'll take some of those to eat, and a lot of times when I'm traveling, we'll, we'll bring that because you don't have time. And I make sure they have something good to eat. We're finished with everything, you know, restaurants go and pick them up. And man, you can taste them, and they're good, and they're healthy, and you know it's doing something good for you. So I'm just saying that that sometimes you, you just got to get out, get rid of the junk, so all of a sudden the good will will taste better. And that's the, that's the lesson here. And then it takes discipline to do that. Uh, let me say something else about your health, your, good, your health to, if you want your youth to be renewed, uh, the, the, this is the start as per Psalm 103 and verse number five, but there is something else that um, will help. And, and it's just important to note that uh, exercise is important, physical exercise. I come to first Timothy four, you're not far from there right now in first Corinthians. 1 Timothy chapter number 4, and in 1 Timothy 4, we read this at the beginning of verse number 8, for bodily exercise profiteth little. Now, he tells you that there is some profit to bodily exercise. It does give you a little profit. Uh, don't, don't minimize it because he says little. It says in the Old Testament, brings this up, you know, it's it's the little foxes that spoil the vines. You know, you're going to have to watch those little things. Um, in Zechariah, I think it is, he says, uh, who hath despised the day of small things? you got to pay attention to little things. Little things can make a big difference. And so uh, bodily exercise profiteth little. There is some profit to exercise, and you need to keep that body active so it doesn't proverbially rust in place. You know, keep those joints moving, right? You got you to get up and, and, and go. You don't want to be a couch potato. Um, you, you, you just got to be active. Uh, I, I think one of the things to keep in mind uh, for bodily exercise uh, that might help you, th think of the need for bodily exercise like this. Uh, move it or lose it. <laughs> you, you just got to. Now, some, some people have a job that keeps them physically active, and that helps. Some people have a job that doesn't keep them physically active, and they're going to have to really work harder at it. And the hard part of that is after you're done with the job, you're tired, you don't feel like doing anything. But again, this word's going to come down to some self-discipline. Uh, a little time of exercise is an investment in your health, and it will help you um, physically, and it'll help you mentally. And if you're already right with God, you'll be surprised. It'll help you spiritually. And so there are benefits to that. So, so find something to do. Uh, there's, there's no lack of different types of exercise that you can indulge in. And uh, I did say indulge. This is a good indulge. But um, uh, when it, if you don't know what to do, it's as easy as just walk. You know, walk. If you, you know, get you a, one of those trackers and, and track your steps and, and try to get a certain amount. And just go out and, and walk. But you, you got to keep that body moving. It, you don't want to become sedentary. Uh, move it or lose it. Just a, a little thing. So, so it is important. Exercise is important. So figure out what you can do. You know, uh, some of you uh, can, uh, again, you, you can do that. You can, you can go to a, a, a gym. There are gyms you can join for a relatively cheap amount per month. Um, YMCA, maybe not so cheap, but your insurance, some of your insurance might cover a YMCA membership. Or if it does cost a little bit, it's, it, it's worth the money if you go there and, and take advantage of it and, and try to do something to help yourself uh, be in good physical shape. Again, it doesn't really cost you a lot to do it if you just want to go out and, and do some walking, uh, do some exercises. Um, figure out something. There's something that you can do to keep that body uh, active, and that will help you. Bodily exercise profiteth little. Now, in Saul, or in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, there's another consideration for your health, 
And in 1 Timothy 4, verse 8, let's read the entire verse. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Godliness will benefit you at the judgment seat of Christ, but it will also benefit you now uh, in, in your life from a physical standpoint. He says it profiteth, godliness profiteth in, in all things, right here, unto all things. So it will also help, your, help you physically as well as spiritually. Don't underestimate the power of godly living on your health. One of the great, greatest things you can do for your health is just stop sinning. Uh, sin drains a person of, his, of their life. If the wage of sin is death and you're sinning, that's not going to lead to an abundant life and a healthy life. It's going to lead to uh, an abundant death and an unhealthy life. That's what um, ungodly living is. Uh, just by stopping the sin principle in your life, you know, uh, you can just you can add years to your life and you can just feel, feel much more vibrant. Um, there's some people, you know, if you, if you got next to some people that were the same age as you, that, that haven't been living right, you can get yourself next to somebody the same age as you, hadn't been living right for, for many years, and uh, you can watch and take a look at them, and, and you may feel a lot better after you look at them because a lot of people will look a lot older because sin will take years off your life and, and add years uh, to the look of the body and the, and the feeling of the body. So don't underestimate the power of godly living on your health. Apply, uh, uh, or, or let, me, let, me, uh, let me have you go... Go to uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. Let me uh, show you some other things that apply to this. 1 Peter chapter number 3. And what I wanted to say just before you go there, for in, uh, in the verse it tells us that godliness is profitable to unto all things, having the promise of the life that now is. That is helping you right now in this life. So your, your physical health, etc. And 1 Peter chapter 3 Starting in verse number 10, we read this, 1 Peter 3, verse number 10. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. Uh, you want to live a better life and a healthier life, then do what he says right there. And what's he saying? Uh, he's telling you to live right. Refrain your tongue from evil. Um, don't speak any guile, any deceitful things. Uh, eschew evil, avoid it. Do good instead. Seek peace. And so all of that will help you uh, to, to have a better life. And the idea of, of love and life there, let me just give you a, a cross reference to that. In Psalm uh, 34, verse 12, where he's quoting from, uh, it's, it, it says this additionally in Psalm 34, 12. What man is he that desireth life? and loveth many days that he may see good. That is the recipe for a long, happy life. You want to live a lot of days, you want to see good, and that's where he says, keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile, depart from evil and do good, seek peace and pursue it. So that's the idea of living a better life by doing uh, what he's telling you right there. Go back to the Old Testament, book of Proverbs. Godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise of the life that now is, as well as that which is to come. And in Proverbs chapter 3, right there nestled into a couple verses that we're very familiar with are two verses that we're less familiar with, but um, are, are greatly beneficial like the previous two. We're familiar with 5 and 6. Amen. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Here's verse 7. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil, it shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Living for the Lord, living right, living a God life is good for you. It's good for your health. It's profitable to all things, godliness is. And as you, when you stop that sin principle, again, that in itself just begins to allow the life forces to, to, to take hold in, in your uh, body. But um, as you also... Uh, Look, that's, that's what he says here, fear in the Lord, to live a godly life. That's going to be health to you, and that's going to be marrow to your bones, and, and healthy bones leads to, to a healthy body and a healthy life. Look at chapter 4, Proverbs 4. He says here in Proverbs 4, verse 20, My son, attend 
to my words. It's the word of God. Uh, incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. The Bible's healthy for you. The Bible as a book is healthy for you uh, every which way. Uh, physically, mentally, spiritually. The Bible is good for you. But here he's talking about particularly health to the flesh. And that's just the scriptures, the word of God. You keep them in the midst of your heart. And you, you think, keep them in your mind. You keep them in your heart. You keep them in your life. And they'll do good to you. Uh, his words do good to them that walk uprightly, another verse uh, indicates. All right, let me add another thing that will help you and you, you need for uh, good physical health. And uh, again, these things, as you see, um, some of these things are, are spoken about from a secular standpoint, just with people out in the world observing them. But you see they all have scriptural roots, and so does this one. Uh, that is appropriate rest. One of the things that people need for good health is they need appropriate rest. Uh, some folks don't get it. And, and they run themselves into the ground, you know, burning the candle at both ends uh, for too long. And that's why Jesus uh, made this statement. They criticize him about the Sabbath day, but he made an enlightening statement, not just as a response to what they said, but just giving us light uh, in general as well. In Mark chapter 2, verse 27, and he said unto them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. God made Sabbath for man. Why? He knew you'd need a day off every once in a while. He you you knew you'd need rest and time, and time to regenerate. God himself made the earth in six days, and then on the seventh day, he rested from his work that he made. And uh, he gave us that pattern. And he made the Sabbath uh, for uh, a man. And we need rest. We need rest sometimes. Elijah needed rest as he, uh, after he battled uh, with the uh, false prophets at uh, the contest of Mount Carmel, he needed rest. And, and so the Lord gave him some rest. He needed rest to renew his physical strength and his mental health because he was having trouble there. Um, some folks, again, they go and 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 they don't get appropriate rest. And they keep themselves, and some of them because, you know, you're just trying to, I understand sometimes you have a busy schedule um, and, and I'm there, but there's times when you just got to stop. It's got to stop the world and just, you know, rest for a bit. But some people, they just want to keep going and want to keep going. And to do that, uh, in order to be able to do that, uh, they keep themselves going with stimulants from, from caffeine to pills. And folks, that catch up with you after a while. If you don't, if you don't get the rest that you need, um, go to Psalm 23. I'll show you what will eventually happen. Psalm 23. I'm not talking about death. <laughs> say Psalm 23, you say, oh, I'm going to die. Well, it could happen. But a um, little, little statement and look at the phraseology in Psalm 23. Of course, you know, verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Look at the beginning of verse number 2. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. If you won't stop and get the rest, and uh, sometimes God will make you stop and get the rest. And so how do you do that? Well, you, I, think you, I think you know. Sometimes you just get so sick and so weak and frail that you can't do anything and you have to rest for a while. It's better, it's better to do it, you know, incrementally if you can. In, uh, in Israel, not only did they have the Sabbath that they were to keep and, and rest that one day a week. And I know we're not bound by that Saturday Sabbath, but the principle is still good uh, to get a day of rest in. Not only did they have that, but they had regular feasts during the year, which included multiple days off in a row. Uh, where, where they could rest from their normal labors. And so those things are good. Uh, and if you, if you don't stop burning the candle at both ends, and if you don't stop trying to just artificially stimulate yourself to keep on going and going, uh, again, eventually, uh, you're going to get sick. And, and you're gonna, you'll be lying down one way or the other. It'll catch up with you. It's not healthy for you. All right, uh, a little exhortation about some of the things we've been saying. Um, talking about satisfying your mouth with good things, a little follow-up to that is this. Um, trade in your bad sweets for good sweets. There's good sweets. Um, you know, fr fruit has, uh, has sweetness to it. Uh, fructose, uh, the fruit sugar, it, it has some sweetness. Maybe hard to taste it if you're um, just indulging in, in uh, you know, super refined sweets and so forth. But God has a particular substance that he's uh, given us for sweetness that also has health-giving properties. And in Proverbs, we left in, we left in Psalm 23. We'll go back to Proverbs. 
in chapter 16. You should be aware of this, Proverbs chapter 16. And there's more to it than I'm going to get into tonight, but I'll just throw it out to you with uh, two verses in regard to your health. Proverbs 16, verse 24, first of all. Proverbs 16, 24. Pleasant words are as in honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bones. Now, in the illustration, he's telling you that pleasant words will do that. They're, they're good. They're sweet to the soul, and that can help you physically as well. But he said they're as in honeycomb. So what he's saying about pleasant words is also true of a honeycomb. It's sweet to the soul, but it's health to the bones. Again, good, healthy bones, making that good, um, healthy marrow to give you a good, healthy body. So honey is God's sweetener. And um, look what he says about it in Proverbs 24. It's God's sweetener, and it is good for you. Proverbs chapter 24. Now, there may be somebody that's an exception to the rule who, who I mean, honey, they can't handle that. I, I don't know. That could happen. But in, by, and, by and large, uh, the bulk of the population can. Um, Proverbs chapter 24, <clears throat> verse 13. And here, look what he says. He says, my son, eat thou honey, because it is good. And the honeycomb, which is sweet to thy taste. That's good. I know some people say, well, I don't like honey. But, well, again, it, God said it's good. Now, I, I happen to like it, and there's some honey that I taste I don't like, um, but, um, but there's honey, you, there's, you can find good honey around that you do like. And I, I think, you know, since I'm not, like, allergic to it or anything like that, I know it doesn't, isn't, isn't detrimental to my health, I think if I didn't like it, I'd pray that God would help me to like it. And I'd try to eat it until I did like it, or try different honey until I found one that I did like. And different honeys have different tastes, depending on you know, where the bees, you know, got the what kind of flowers and stuff they were using and blossoms to, to make the honey with. Um, and, and so, but God tells you right here, eat it. He said, it is good. So, you know, you don't have to wonder about it because you'll have people out there in the secular world say all different kinds of things. And even Christians say all different kinds of things. Well, honey is sweet too. It's sugar. It's, it's a good sweetener. And it's good for you. And we already saw it's good for your health. And here God says, it is good. And he says, my son, eat thou honey. If you are a son of God and this and honey, you're not allergic to honey, then then eat it. I mean, that's just, I just recommend it. Try trading in your bad sweets for good. You can use honey to sweeten um, uh, other things that you make as well. I mean, uh, look, just nice, good piece of toast with butter and honey. <laughs> And uh, I, and I, I eat, you know, I, I don't eat that I eat it that way a lot, but I do have it sometimes, and I can taste it right now. I'm thinking about the crunch. <laughs> Chances are, I'll have some later on. <laughs> now that it's on my brain. Well, let's talk. Let's go from there. Uh, we've been talking about eating uh, for your health. Now we're going to talk about not eating for your health. Well, this would be fun. Um, Isaiah chapter 58. We talk about not eating. Not eating. We're talking about that biblical discipline called fasting. And while the Bible has much to say about it, I'm just going to look at it right now in the context of how it can help your health. Because because the Lord will satisfy your mouth with good things for your for your health to renew your youth as the eagles, and then sometimes you just need to give the internal digestive organs and everything that processes stuff inside of your body, you need to give it a break as well. And that's where fasting comes in. And fasting is good for you. Now, I don't know, I don't know how old I was before I even knew the word fasting and what it meant. Um, to me, when I was a, a kid here, what we called fasting was a crash diet. <laughs> and a crash diet means you're not going to eat anything, which you figure you're going to crash, you're going to die. We, we thought, you know, that's what's going to happen. Um, but but fasting, again, is going for a period of time without food. And in Isaiah 58, the Lord's talking about a fast, a particular type of fast that He's chosen. In verse 6, is not this the fast that I've chosen? He talks about the proper motives for it, to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and actually break every yoke. And then talks about dealing your bread to the hungry and so forth in verse number 7. And as a result, He, he tells you what's going to happen if you do this proper scriptural fasting in verse number eight, and he says, Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and here's what I want you to notice for night, and thine health shall spring forth speedily. Thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. 
The glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. But he says, thine health shall spring forth speedily. Proper scriptural fasting can, can help your health to spring forth speedily. Quite frankly, there's people who don't even do it for a scriptural or spiritual reason, but some of them fast for health reasons because it's a natural process that helps the body uh, to, to get uh, better, to heal uh, itself, to uh, allow the Lord to, to work in it by, by the way that he's got it set up. And, you know, it, sometimes in order to maybe motivate yourself, you might need to read a little bit more about it or listen to, you know, a message about it. And I've preached on it several times uh, through the years. And then, or, or read a good book about it. I've read I have a couple of books that I've uh, read about it. Uh, the first, first book I ever read about it uh, was called Fast Your Way to Health, H-E-L-T-H. It was written by um, an evangelist named J. Harold Smith, uh, who was famous for preaching a message called God's Three Deadlines. And um, uh, for some reason in there, if you get the book and read it, it's probably out of print, but you can probably find a copy somewhere. Uh, it's he, he doesn't quote all King James in there, which was surprising to me. But uh, when, even when I read it as a very young Christian within the first year of being saved, I just uh, knew enough to just take the reference that he referred to and look him up in the King James. And I, maybe that wasn't his doing. Maybe it was the publisher that took it over uh, and did it. Uh, but, uh, but nevertheless, there's a lot of good truth in there. And he's the first one that ever pointed me to the subject of fasting in Isaiah 58. And I began to look at that through the years and just run with it. But, um, but he understood and he practiced and learned by experience that it can help bring about health. And, and the Bible tells it to you right here. It can help you. Fasting, they say, will rejuvenate you physically, mentally, spiritually. I won't take the time to show you, uh, but, but that is in uh, the chapter here as well. And I'm saying, I'm saying the secular people tell you that it, that it rejuvenates you those three areas. But it was in the scriptures all along. Uh, uh, a, today, a popular practice, uh, maybe even a fad, we'll see how long it lasts, but, but you can read about it, hear about it. That, that that's, has emerged within just, I only heard about within the last few years, but it's this thing called intermittent fasting, where folks understand it's good to give the body rest. For intermittent, intermittent fasting, what they do is um, they won't eat for a certain amount of hours uh, each day, and then, and then they'll confine their eating to a certain amount of hours. And, in other words, they're not going to eat from, from, sun, from when the time they get up to the time they go to bed, but there'll be only be a certain space of time in which they eat. And um, uh, I, I will just say this about, about that practice. It was around in the Bible a long time before people started discovering it. You know, some of the Bible fasts, they weren't 40 days. Some of them weren't um, uh, three days even. Some of them weren't even a full 24 hours. Sometimes he would have the children of Israel fast until even. That was an, it, what they call today an intermittent fast. But they got great results spiritually. But uh, a residual benefit of that, according to this even, was that your health would spring forth speedily. And notice he says, thine health shall spring forth speedily. It can bring about quick results. Uh, the other book I, uh, there's one other book I read about fasting was called uh, The Miracle of Fasting. Um, and and he, it had some, some Bible references, some spiritual references to it. But uh, more from just a health perspective by a man named uh, Paul Bragg, who um, used to do a lot of writing. You still get his products, I mean, they, with his name on it. Uh, Bragg's apple cider vinegar, you might find it. You can, you can get that at Walmart um, and, uh, and other things. Um, uh, it's got another thing that's kind of a flavor thing. It reminds you of a soy sauce, but I can't remember what it's called right now. You know what that thing is? Some amino acids, I think it is, um, liquid amino acids, um, and so forth. But but uh, he wrote a book about it, and you can learn a lot from just the, the physiology of it and how to do it and what to expect, and uh, as well as spiritual things. But uh, fasting, you know, is something recommended in the Scripture. The idea of Psalm 103 and verse number 5 is kind of renewing your health, renewing your strength, renewing your youth is what he says. I had came across a book some years ago. Um, I had it before, before I moved up here and became pastor. Uh, this book's called Become Younger by a man named uh, Dr. Norman Walker. And back when I got it, I mean, I wrote in there my name on the, on the page, but I wrote Psalm 103.5 on there because that's what it reminded me of, his idea of becoming younger. I'll just read you one little thing about this, one little thing from the book right at the very beginning in the first chapter um, and uh, his, his title of the chapter is, You Are Never Too Old to Become Younger. Um, you are as 
you, you as, just as you are, just as you are what you eat, so also you are as young or as old as you feel. Years have nothing whatsoever to do with a person's age, except insofar that it records the passage of time. They make this statement. One can be old at 30, and one can be young at 70. There's a lot of truth in that. So you can have, you can do your best to have good health and better health and to help you feel better, and that'll help you all the way around. Now, to be sure, look, I know there's some things we don't have control over when it comes to our health, but don't let the things you don't have control over prevent you from doing the things that you do have control over that can contribute to good health. All right, let's close with uh, this. Third John, toward the end of your Bible. John's writing this little epistle, and in Third John, he says this in the first two verses. Third John one chapter, verse number one, the elder, that'd be John himself, unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. I could say that what John um, uh, wished for uh, uh, his friends, friend he's writing to here, uh, those well-beloved Gaius, that's the same wish that I have for you as, as a pastor and friend. Same which I have for me. I mean, uh, I see your souls prospering. I, I want that to prosper even more and more so. And, we, and that's more of what's being preached and, and taught about. But I also want to see you in good health. Uh, health battles are just, you know, they're, they're there. It's just, it's just there in life. They're all around us. Um, stuff going wrong and people having problems. I, you, know, you know how it is. Wednesday night prayer meeting, prayer requests. It's not unusual for over half of the requests to, to be for somebody's health. Somebody that's sick, somebody going through something physically, because it's just that prevalent. And, and no matter what you do, you, you, you're probably still going to have some health issues somewhere along the line. We are in bodies that are dying, right? Um, we're not in a glorified body yet, but you can do what you can to improve things. So, so I'm just exhorting you to do things. And if you can get in better health, you'll feel better. Hey, for what it's worth, you look in the mirror and you'll like what you see better. <laughs> And, and you'll think more clearly, and you'll become more productive. And everything that I talked to you about tonight and those little kind of bullet points down through there, uh, they can help you to that end. So, uh, so there it is. Uh, pray and consider and see what, uh, what the Lord would have you to do about it to improve your life. And like they say, this could be the first day of the rest of your life. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you are concerned for our souls. You saved us. You, you sent us Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that um, uh, by, by way of testimony tonight, uh, each person here knows who is their Savior, and, uh, and I thank you for that. And, Lord, I, I thank you also that not only do you care about our souls, but you, you care about our health, and, and you can help us to be better along those and do better and feel better along those lines. So help us, Lord, to take heed to these things. I know a better-feeling uh, body tends to get more, uh, more done. And at the same time, Lord, I know you can work in spite of these things. I know there have been people, Lord, that have had poor health and bad health, and you took and you perfected uh, your strength and their weakness. And should we ever find ourselves in that condition, may you do the same for us. But what we do have control over, help us to, to do our best to honor and glorify you, Lord. Like you said, glorify you in our body and our spirit, uh, which belong to you. So teach us these things and teach us how to apply them to our own personal lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We'll have the music play. You can remain seated or come down to the altar or pray at your pew. Uh, but uh, while the music plays, we'll take some time to pray.
Let's take our song books. This is a good song for uh, the message that they're playing, Wonderful Words of Life. Let's sing a couple verses of it or so before we go. 472. 472. Let's do this. We'll sing the first and the last. 472. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words. Wonderful words of life, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life. Jesus, only Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Amen. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you.